Simkin. So very fond of fairy stories and has been ill. So a new tale that nobody has ever read before will certainly cheer her up. My dear Frida, because you are fond of fairy tales and have been ill, I've made you a story all for yourself. It is all about an old tailor who lived in Gloucester. In the time of swords and periwigs and full-skirted coats with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold-laced waistcoats of padwasoy and taffeta, there lived a tailor in Gloucester. One bitter cold day near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat. The finest of wedding coats for the mayor of Gloucester. And a cream-colored satin waistcoat trimmed with gauze and green worsted chenille. Oh. Now, how can I fashion this with the least waste of these expensive stuffs? For I am sure I cannot afford to waste the smallest piece. Ah, now let me see. <laughs> Two narrow breaths for naught except westcuts for mice. <laughs> What I've got? Oh my! Oh how beautiful! By my whiskers, I cannot remember when we last had silk of such quality on these premises. And look at this! And look, look at this! Ah, hmm, hmm. Perhaps there may just be yes, yes, a, a magnificent coat, but we'll need more silk. Uh, yes, thank you. Now we'll see. <laughs> what does he say? Ah, yes. Um, one bread there, one bread there, and um, uh, more thread. Uh, yes, more thread. Yes, and a measuring tape. 
Scissors, pins. Needle? Yes, yes. More silk. More silk. More silk. We need more silk. More silk. More silk. <laughs> now, the lining. Ah, oh, yes. Of course. Just the thing. Yellow taffeta. Yellow taffeta. Yellow taffeta. Yellow taffeta for the lining. What? Yellow taffeta for the lining. Um. He says the lining will be yellow taffeta. Oh, my. Yellow taffeta. Uh, just what I would have chosen myself. Uh, but has he commenced cutting yet? Oh, masterly. Masterly. <laughs> masterly. Masterly. Oh. My poor back, but it is done. Now, let me see. That is uh, one, two, three, twelve. Twelve? Twelve. Coat, and then four pieces for the west guard. Four, four, four pieces. For all the lining. What? There's no breadth at all. Tippets for mice and ribbons for mobs. It is no breadth at all. But it is all done. Now, let me see. Oh, I'm so weary. And the light is fading fast. Now then, there's pocket flaps, cuffs and buttons. Yes, all is ready for the morning. All ready and sufficient. Except for one item. And I am wanting one single skein of cherry-colored twisted silk. The tailor lived quite nearby in College Court. Being so poor, he rented just the kitchen of a house, next to the doorway to College Green. The mice were more fortunate and did not have to brave the bitter cold. With their secret passages and stairways, they could run from house to house. Indeed, all over town without ever going into the street. of our fourpence, buy me one penneth of cherry-coloured silk. B but do not lose that last penny, Simkin, or I am undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. I shall make my fortune <laughs> to be cut on the bias. Mm. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning, and he hath ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta, and the taffeta sufficeth. There is no more left over in snippets than will serve to make tippets for mice. This is passing extremely. 
job, maybe. I wager this is all Simpkins doing, the rascal. I wonder what... Was I wise to entrust my last four pence to Simkin? I don't know. The waistcoat is cut out from peach-coloured satin. One and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured silk. Should to be finished by noon on Saturday. And this is Tuesday evening. Oh. Was it right to let loose those mice? Undoubtedly the property of Simkin. Alack, I am undone, for I have no more twist. What is that? Oh, same kid. Tremble so. Well, what of the embroidery? Oh, only the finest stitching will suffice. Oh. Oh. One and twenty buttonholes. One and twenty buttonholes. Of cherry coloured twist to be finished by oh, noon. Finished by noon. On Saturday. On Saturday. No Saturday. more twist. No more twist. It is already Tuesday. Oh. And it is Tuesday what is evening. To of the cherry coloured coat? No more twist. <laughs> and what should he do? Oh, no what twist. is to become of the cherry coloured coat? <laughs> oh, yes. oh yes. yes, yes, yes. Wait for me. And the waistcoat, embroidered with poppies and cornflowers. The waistcoat of cream coloured satin by Saturday, you say. Cut on the cross, yes, and lined with yellow taffeta. For the mayor's wedding. To be finished by Saturday, and it's Tuesday evening. Trimmed with gauze and chenille, to be ready for Christmas Day. Oh, what a magnificent Ah, these venison pasties. He gave us tippets for mice. Oh, my. Is all clear? In the tailor's shop in Westcott Street, the embroidered silk and satin lay cut upon the table. And who should come to sew them when the window was barred and the door fast locked?
shall become the bear's wedding clothes. For there is no more twist. No more twist. The twist. The twist. What shall become of us? for three days and nights, and now it was Christmas Eve. But it is in the old story that all the beasts can talk in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the morning, though there are very few folk that can hear them or know what it is they say. Mrs. Bond, there's geese in the larder and ducks in the pond, but my master's cupboard is as empty as old Mother Hubbard's. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to fetch her dog a bone. So when she got there, the cupboard was there, and so the poor doggy had none. Oh. Oh. Right across the Banbury Cross. Diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, all the cats in Gloucester, except me. Lives in the well, kitty alone, kitty alone, a merry mouse in the mill, cock me carry, kitty alone, kitty alone. It was a frog in the well, kitty alone, kitty alone, a merry mouse in the mill, cock me carry, kitty alone, kitty alone. Frog me word, a word.
No more twist. No more twist. No more twist. <laughs> Saturday. The bear is... I am worn to a raveling, but I have my twist. Lovely day for the mayor's wedding. It's a beautiful day for the wedding. Happy Christmas. A fine day. Yes, it's a beautiful day. Happy Christmas! A beautiful day for the mayor and his <laughs> mom! <laughs> Alack, I have my twist. But no more strength nor time than will serve to make me one single buttonhole. For this is Christmas Day in the morning. The mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon. And where is his cherry-colored coat? Mine, Simkin. Let me open the door. My favor must still be with me. I cannot believe my eyes. Oh, joy! The miracle! Oh, these exquisite roses. Just look at the pansies. Oh, the poppies. Oh, I've never seen such cornflowers. But what is this? Such tiny writing. Uh, no more twist. <laughs> How beautiful! A fine coat! Such ruffles! Uh, <laughs> such embroidered cuffs and lappets! Just like the mares! Magnificent! <gasps> such tabby silks and, and, and rosebuds! Oh, but the buttonholes are the greatest triumph! The stitches of those buttonholes were so small. They looked as if they had been made by little mice. On Christmas night, two Christians sing to hear the news the angels bring. On Christmas night, two Christians sing to hear the news the angels bring. News of great joy, news of great mirth. News of a merciful king's birth. Then why should men on earth be so sad since our Redeemer made us glad? Then why should men on earth be so sad since our Redeemer made us glad? And from our sin he set us free, all for to gain our liberty. On out of darkness we have made which made the angels sing this night. On out of darkness we have made which made the angels sing this night. Glory to God and peace to men, now and forevermore. Amen. On Christmas Day, O Christian sing. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day.
You have just been watching the film of one of the delightful stories that were written and illustrated by Beatrix Potter, one of the most popular children's authors in the world. Her fame started nearly a hundred years ago with the publication in 1902 of The Tale of Peter Rabbit, and that fame continues and grows today. Beatrix Potter was a Victorian child. She was born in 1866 in London, where her father was a wealthy lawyer, living in a big house in a fashionable London square. Today, we might think that Beatrix had a lonely life. She seldom saw her father and mother except to say goodnight, and she didn't go to school and meet other children. She lived upstairs on the third floor of the house, where she was cared for and taught lessons by a nurse and later on a governess. But that was how the children of the well-to-do middle-class parents lived in those times. There were servants and horses and carriages, making it a comfortable, well-ordered life for the Victorians who had money. Their children were expected to be seen, but seldom heard. Beatrix lived this rather lonely life in the upstairs nursery until she was six, when her brother Bertram was born. She was already starting to show a strong interest in flowers and animals and in drawing pictures of them. Although Bertie was a lot younger, they became great friends, and as he grew up, they were allowed to keep an extraordinary variety of pet animals. Rats, mice, rabbits, guinea pigs, lizards, squirrels, hedgehogs, and even a bat. These pets gave them endless pleasure, and would eventually lead Beatrix to her immense fame as an artist and a storyteller. She wasn't just fond of her pet animals, but fascinated by them. She studied them closely and drew hundreds of pictures of them, not childish squiggles, but meticulously accurate, scientifically detailed pictures. She was a keen observer in her own private schoolroom and at public museums, and her drawings became so good that her father engaged art teachers so that she could be properly trained. But mostly, she taught herself. When her brother was sent away to boarding school, she was sometimes lonely. But she was too busy to be bored. She read a great deal and studied her animals and flowers and funguses and beetles. She became a very knowledgeable naturalist and always an artist. Beatrix found her mother somewhat cold and distant, but she was fond of her father and shared many of his interests. The whole family went on holiday regularly to the country together. Every summer they would spend as much as three months in the suitably big kind of house that Mr. Potter always rented. They must have made a pretty impressive spectacle, the family, their entourage of servants and piles of luggage. Beatrix always took her pet animals away with her, even on trains. The immortal Benjamin Bunny was taken as well, on a lead. Mr. Potter was a very keen and gifted photographer, using a delayed time switch when he wanted to be in the picture as well. Everybody had to sit absolutely still, which tended to make them look rather solemn. The family took their summer holidays in Scotland every year until Beatrix was 16. Mr. Potter then made a change that was to have a profound effect on Beatrix's life. He chose a truly grand castle on the shores of Windermere in the English Lake District. At once Beatrix Potter fell in love with the place. That love was to last and inspire her throughout her life so that she dedicated her last 30 years to the preservation of the Lake District for the children of today.